The year is 1895. College sports, still in its infancy, is facing its toughest challenge yet. While the Ivy League titans continue to grow, the rest of the sports world stumbles. Football, still yet to introduce the read option, the West Coast offense, or even the forward pass, is a graveyard. Scores of college football players will die in the 10 years between 1890 and the turn of the next century, with only a select few being documented. Parents and school presidents will turn their backs on the garish game as more and more young men die of spinal fractures, brain injuries, and crushed bones that can't be cleaned effectively. In just 10 years' time from 95, the sport of football will be on its deathbed and will famously only survive largely in part due to President Theodore Roosevelt's intervention that favored the forward pass. Teddy isn't the only one desperate to save the game, though. This man is, too. James Henry Smart the president of Purdue University in Indiana. Smart himself wears a lot of hats in a time where hats are cool, but he's perhaps about to wear his biggest and featheriest hat yet. As criticism mounts, Smart plans to build a grouping of schools to help form rules to save football, as well as other sports. He contacts presidents at the universities of Illinois, Minnesota, Northwestern, and Wisconsin, as well as the presidents of the University of Chicago and Lake Forest College in Illinois to meet him in Chicago. There, they discuss a few things, namely sports rules and athlete eligibility issues, which would come into effect as early as 1904. They agree with each other enough to group together a second time in 1896, calling themselves the Intercollegiate Conference of Faculty Representatives, otherwise known as the Western Conference. Lake Forest College had balked at meeting again and was replaced by the University of Michigan. These were the first seven members of the Western Conference, but they didn't stay at seven for long. Taking them to nine were the additions of Indiana and Iowa in 1899, but they almost weren't the only members to be added. Nebraska was considered for the 10th and final additive spot in 1900, but the conference members elected against it, likely due to travel concerns. 1902 saw the first ever Rose Bowl, a bout between Michigan and Stanford. This game, over time, would come to be known as one of college football's prized jewels. It was quintessentially college football. Despite the conference being so young, universities still found a way to come at odds with each other. Unsurprisingly, it was connected to the very rules the conference had been created to help regulate. Michigan had elected to separate themselves from the conference when it came to scheduling football games and athlete eligibility. The conference had, in 1905, settled on student-athletes being eligible for three years and that member schools shouldn't schedule more than five games a season. Michigan didn't like that and they were voted out of the conference by the other schools. They would not return until 1916, four years after their rivals, Ohio State, were first introduced to the conference. It is at this point, 1916, that the conference begins to be known as the Big Ten, but the conference would remain officially as the ICFR until 1987. As the tides of college sports began to shift away from the Ivies westward, the ICFR largely made sense for rising teams in the 20s and 30s. The arena where this was mostly seen was in football. Being the sport the conference was largely built off of in 1896, football had always seen a pointed focus within the conference. Names like the first ever Heisman winner in Jay Berwanger and the eventual leader of the Monsters of the Midway in Bronco Nagurski littered newspapers across the country. Before the end of World War II, Big Ten teams claimed a handful of championships. Michigan took home championship claims from 1901 through 1904, as well as 1918, 1923, 1932, and 1933. Ohio State claimed one in 1942. Minnesota claimed one in 1904, and is so far the only college sports program in history to win three straight national titles, which they did in 1934, 1935, and 1936. Illinois has claims to national championships in 1914, 1919, 1923, and 1927. Iowa had claims in 1921 and 1922. But the real titan in those early years was Chicago, winning national titles in 1905 and 1913. Led by head coach Amos Alonzo Stagg, the Maroons led a reign of terror against the Western Conference and the rest of the country. They won seven conference titles from 1899 to 1924, more than any other team not named Michigan with eight or Minnesota with seven, in that 25-year time span, and put up four seasons where they did not lose a single game. 
but when Stagg left to coach at the University of the Pacific in 1932, the Maroons started to fall apart. It began when the university replaced Stagg with his assistant, Clark Shaughnessy, who struggled to get over 500 in his time on the sidelines. But the president of UChicago, Robert Maynard Hutchins, wanted to focus Chicago's efforts on academics rather than sports, and seeing football as a distraction to other students eliminated the program over Christmas break in 1939. Without their moneymaker in conference, the Maroons fell further and further out of competition in the Big Ten. In 1946, they withdrew officially from the conference. But this left a gaping hole in the Big Ten, now once again, the Big Nine. The conference cast a wide net in searching for a replacement. They focused on states that already had members, like adding Iowa State for Iowa, Marquette for Wisconsin, or Notre Dame for Indiana, as well as expanding to new states, like taking the Cornhuskers in Nebraska or Pitt in Pennsylvania. But one program stuck out the largest. Michigan State, formerly Michigan Agricultural in East Lansing, would become the 10th member of the Big Ten Conference in 1949. Aside from being a natural geographic fit and a rival of in-conference Michigan, the Spartans were also academic and athletic fits. Proof of this can be seen in the Spartans' immediate emergence upon entering the Big Ten, claiming six football national titles from 1951 to 1966. Let's go back to the Rose Bowl for a second, specifically in 1946. You see, from its inception in 1902 to 1946, the Rose Bowl game wasn't necessarily set to be a Big Ten team versus a Pac-10 team. It was known as an invitational game, most often with a team from the Pacific Coast Conference, a pack predecessor, playing an invited team from the East. That wasn't a Big Ten team all the time. Sometimes it was Notre Dame. Sometimes it was Alabama. Sometimes it was the Navy. The Big Ten and PCC had similar attitudes towards desegregating college sports. The PCC chose the Big Ten to be their somewhat permanent dance partner for the Rose Bowl game from 1947 onward, with both conferences electing to send their champions to the game. From 1946 to 2002, when the Rose Bowl was first used as the BCS National Championship and therefore had no allegiances directly to the Pac or Big Ten, the Big Ten delegate to the game won 28 out of 55 games, good for just over 50%. With the advent of the BCS in 1998, the Rose Bowl would attempt to keep its Pac Midwest ties active unless the number one or number two team were set to play in the National Championship instead. The 40s and 50s brought another sport to focus in the Big Ten, basketball specifically in the state of Indiana, where basketball had created a craze in the state not unlike that seen in the states of Kansas and North Carolina. Prior to the 40s, when the NCAA began authorizing national title tournaments to select their national champions, some Big Ten teams were retroactively deemed national champions by the Helms Athletic Foundation. But starting in 1940, we can see a central lean in basketball championships, specifically within the state of Indiana. Of the 10 national titles won by the Big Ten since 1940, half belonged to the Hoosiers, led by two-time national champion head coach Branch McCracken from 1938 to 1965. The Hoosiers were no stranger to talented head coaches, as noted controversial chair thrower Bob Knight also paced the hardwood for the Hoosiers. That's not to say the Boilermakers, the other Indiana Big Ten team, weren't also a solid squad. Under head coach Piggy Lambert from 1917 to 1946, the Boilermakers were so good that only Tom Izzo, Gene Keedy, and, oh hey, Bob Knight, had bested his total Big Ten wins. He helped the Boilermakers take home 11 conference championships during that time as well. They lead the conference with 25 total regular season Big Ten championships, 13 of which are outright. Indiana and Purdue's heightened basketball prowess, like Chicago and football before them, led to their peers improving their own basketball facilities and teams to compete with them ending up with a Midwestern conference that plays very, very solid basketball, despite not having won a national championship since Michigan State won one in 2000. I'm getting ahead of myself again. The 40s also saw the Big Ten take a step forward in another frontier for college sports, integration. Just a year after Jackie Robinson broke baseball's color barrier, Indiana's Bill Garrett technically broke the Big Tens, shattering what had been called a gentleman's agreement to not play black players in basketball games for the conference. Indiana President Herman Wells, who had spent some time already eliminating racial barriers on campus, was eager to let Garrett play ball. He wasn't the first black Big Ten player, though. There were a few other athletes, like George Jewett at Michigan and Northwestern, that technically broke the barrier beforehand, sometimes back in the 1890s. But with the gentlemen's agreement gone, it became much more socially acceptable for those players to play on those squads. 
teams began to gradually be filled with more and more racially diverse rosters instead of just one or two black men. The Big Ten's athletic prominence took a huge step forward in the late 60s to early 70s, with their iron grip on football in the Midwest getting even tighter. This was no more apparent nationwide than in its most vibrant football rivalry, Ohio State and Michigan, which had grown so testy that it was shortened to simply the game. Buckeye head coach Woody Hayes and Wolverine coach Bo Schembechler had come to be known as football titans. During a stretch of games known to history as the Ten-Year War, these two programs, who had come to be the strongest in their conference, traded blows from 1969 to 1978. Ohio State took home four victories, Michigan took home five, including the last three, and the two teams even shared a rare tie. For years, they stood like this. The mighty Big Ten. From the icy lakes of Minnesota down through the rolling fields of Illinois and Indiana and up through Ohio into Michigan. And mighty they certainly were. I'll touch up on national championships near the end of the video, so we'll see the athletic side of the conference there. But now, as we move from the 50s onward into the 60s and 70s, it's time we recognize another of the conference's strengths. It's academics. Each school is considered to be a top school for something and they routinely end up in the top section of most subjective academic rankings in the United States, including a few considered to be public ivies. While the athletic side of things was certainly important, the Big Ten had long since clutched its academic identity close to its chest. Presidents and board members have utilized the success of their athletic programs to continue the upkeep and in some cases improve their academics to staggering heights. The conference would remain in its 10-team state for a long time. That is, until television contract money began to make regional independence less attractive. One of these programs that determined television money to be worth it was Penn State. 1985 saw NCAA versus Oklahoma decide for the nation that colleges and their athletic departments, and by extension their conferences, were responsible for television contract negotiations, not the NCAA as a whole. Until this point, being an independent was in some cases fortuitous, in some cases tough, and in some others, like Penn State's, a means to an end of forming a regional schedule when lots of your rivals and common opponents are in different conferences. Once the ruling came down and it became apparent that independence was no longer all that feasible for big guys like PSU, they started putting feelers out towards a conference. The most powerful man in Pennsylvania, head football coach Joe Paterno, certainly had his own ideas. According to fan site Black Shoe Diaries, in the early 80s, while he was also acting athletic director, Paterno noticed that allegiance to the Atlantic 10 was hurting the school's athletic department as a whole, even if their titan of a football program stayed independent. Instead, he thought up a Northeastern conference that would have been a precursor to the Big East, essentially an Eastern Big Ten in its own right. It would have featured rivals of Penn State, like Pitt and Syracuse, as well as West Virginia, Boston College, Maryland, and for some reason Temple, among others. But since this wasn't feasible, and PSU knew that, they needed to look elsewhere. Once the Big East was formed, Penn State applied there, but was denied because the focus of the conference wasn't football quite yet. While the ACC was certainly an option that would keep Penn State in the East, they just kept circling back to the Big Ten. They began reaching out in secret to specific people in the conference, notably Commissioner Jim Delaney and Illinois President Stanley Eikenberry. Without asking anybody involved in athletics, the Big Ten presidents voted to allow the Nittany Lions into their tight organization in 1990. This made just about everybody involved in athletics very upset. Not because it was Penn State, but because it was done in secret. The decision was almost overturned out of spite, entirely because the people who had to vote were blindsided by the violation of trust and openness. It took in-house, personal negotiations to convince the sitting Big Ten powers that be to add the Nittany Lions. They did. They joined the conference effectively in 1993. That left the Big Ten with 11 members. While the odd numbering did lead to one of the greatest conference logos of all time, with an 11 cleverly disguised in negative space, there were some conversations about expanding to 12. The school that earned the brunt of these conversations was the conference's white whale, Notre Dame. The conference engaged in merger talks with members of the Irish Brass in 1999, with a majority of faculty in suits being very interested in becoming the 12th member of the conference. However, despite there being mutual interest, the final decision was made on the part of the Irish, who decided against joining the conference due to the strength of the university's ideals, which boiled down to Catholic, private, independent. 
Notre Dame would be only the second private school in the conference after Northwestern, and the only university still associated outright with Catholicism. They hitched their post to independence as their final characteristic worth defining them. Some believe the real reason behind their rejection was due to them not wanting to give up their broadcast rights with NBC in order to join a conference. However, before the Irish's flirtation, the Big Ten also explored some other options. Missouri was reportedly interested as early as 1993, beginning a two-decade-long search for greener pastures outside Middle America. Alongside them were their Big 8 rivals in Kansas and the history-laden Rutgers in New Jersey. With the Big 12's formation in 1996, however, Missouri and Kansas rescinded their interest, and Rutgers returned to being Rutgers. As the years turned into the 2000s, expansion was consistently a topic brought up in Big Ten board meetings, specifically as other conferences, spurred by the Big Ten themselves adding Penn State years prior, began to reach 12 teams for the prospect of adding a conference championship game via two divisions. The Big Ten needed to keep up, especially as the ACC began to inhale the Big East. This would come to a head in 2009, when Commissioner Jim Delaney outwardly announced that the conference would be looking to add that 12th member. Nebraska, irked by Texas's growing grasp over the increasingly shaky Big 12 conference they had called home for years and years, once again expressed interest in joining the Big Ten conference by applying for membership on June 11, 2010. Once that interest was reciprocated that very same day, the Cornhuskers were announced as the conference's 12th member by unanimous vote. There was an interesting aspect to this courtship, however. As of 2010, every member of the Big Ten conference had been a member of the Association of American Universities, or AAU. The AAU is a voted-in membership of research universities across the United States that is widely considered to be the elite in academic research, and even more widely considered to just be an old boys club for universities that can buy membership. Big Ten Commissioner Jim Delaney was on record as saying that AAU membership was important for Big Ten membership, as the conference did want to preserve their academic excellence. In order to make themselves more attractive to the Big Ten, Nebraska Brass bull-rushed AAU membership, rushing through the qualifications and the process in order to ensure their admission. A few months after they were admitted into the Big Ten, however, Nebraska lost their membership in AAU. Nebraska, now the westernmost member, immediately presented an interesting quandary within conference walls. How does one split the league into divisions? Finding a spot to play the championship game in Indianapolis was easy. This was hard. A simple east-west split would have caused some problems, as the conference as old as the Big Ten had many rivalries. As of 2011, the Big Ten was full of rivalries. Many teams had multiple. I mean, look at these. Eli Buck, Brass Spittoon, Old Oak and Bucket, Floyd of Rosedale, Land Grant Trophy, Paul Bunyan and Paul Bunyan's Axe, those are two different rivalries, Little Brown Jug, George Jewett, Victory Bell, the $5 Bits of Broken Chair, because who could forget the $5 Bits of Broken Chair? So to keep as many rivalries as possible, they instead chose to split the two non-geographical divisions instead the laughably named Leaders and Legends Divisions. The Leaders Division stretched from Pennsylvania to Wisconsin, featuring the Badgers, Illini, Boilermakers, Hoosiers, Buckeyes, and Nittany Lions. In the Legends were the Cornhuskers, Gophers, Hawkeyes, Wildcats, Spartans, and Wolverines. This alignment decision lasted only three seasons, and was replaced in 2014 due to the poor cohesion of its parts. One thing that came out of the Leaders and Legends experiment that did stick around was the Big Ten's new conference logo, known affectionately as B1G, or just big. The conference still uses this logo today. 2012 saw more additions into the conference. As the SEC added Missouri and Texas A&M to get to 14 member schools, the Big Ten found itself needing to respond in order to keep up with the conference that had come to be its rival in the college sports world. As the world began to move less away from geography and more towards money, one thing became apparent. The SEC was getting more, and the Big Ten needed to compete. A few schools were not considered. Missouri had been hoping for Big Ten admission, but their interest was not reciprocated, partially leading to their admission into the SEC. And despite having their best stretch of football in years right around the trouble with the Big Ten and being an AAU member, the Big Ten showed very little interest in Kansas, something that continued when the Big 12 appeared to be collapsing again in 2020. Instead, teams in larger eastern markets looked to be intriguing to the conference. Maryland in the D.C. market and Rutgers in the New York City market. Maryland applied for exit from the ACC after lengthy and unsure internal debate. They would join the Big Ten Conference officially in 2014. A day after Maryland was approved, Rutgers' application was also approved. Since becoming the 12th, 13th, and 14th members of the Big Ten Conference respectively, only Maryland has won a conference championship in one of the Big Three men's sports, 
winning a share of the basketball title in 2020, leading to claims of those teams only being brought in for their media market share and not for the quality of athletics they brought to the table. After adding the Terrapins and Scarlet Knights to the conference, divisions were once again redone in 2014, this time into an Eastern and Western division. The only discrepancy came in splitting the state of Indiana in half, which was solved by making the interstate rivalry a permanent out-of-division rivalry game to be played every season in football. Other sports where divisions were not needed, like basketball, didn't follow this divisional setup. One small ripple effect of the additions of Rutgers and Maryland was in the fact that it created a surprisingly strong push for lacrosse in conference. While women's lacrosse in conference already had six participants, with Maryland and Rutgers joining Michigan, Northwestern, Penn State, and Ohio State, the Wildcats and Wolverines did not support men's lacrosse teams, leaving the conference with just four members. To fill this hole and get to the required six, the Big Ten extended an affiliate invitation to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and asked Michigan to elevate their men's program from club to scholarship level. The conference was also able to secure a hockey membership with Notre Dame, although that would end up being the only Big Ten membership the Irish would have with the conference, as the rest of their affiliates not involved with football would move to the ACC. And then, along came 2020. While conferences were still struggling to determine what to do with their athletic seasons during the... The Big Ten was standing watch over the rest of the country. Whether or not to play football at all was a toss-up, as the conference would eventually wait to play their conference schedule later in the season, as opposed to at its onset in August. But they were anything but stagnant when a bombshell arose from Texas in 2020. An angered Texas A&M athletic director Ross Bjork leaked to the college sports world that Texas and Oklahoma were planning on eventually leaving the Big 12 for the SEC. While this blindsided the Big 12, losing their two premier brands, the Big 10 also had cause for concern. Their arms race against the SEC for dollars just took a huge turn. They chose to form a sort of alliance with the Pac-12 and ACC, though the firm details of this were never truly hashed out aside from some vague intentions about scheduling agreements. Uh, guess how that turned out. These were no longer conferences of colleges with geography and history as the sole important aspects in mind. They were mega corporations. And the Big Ten, now the second member of a Power Two, was now at a disadvantage. Another surprise hit in 2022, this time far away from the Midwest, in Los Angeles, California. USC and UCLA, two of the Pac-12's most valuable brands themselves, announced that they would be leaving the Pac-12 for the Big Ten Conference. This happened right before a new television deal was discussed for the Big Ten, proving to be a boon in those negotiations. They'd be set to join in 2024. With the Big 12 having already taken the best group of five expansion candidates available and the conference leadership electing against a lucrative streaming deal with Apple, the Pac-12 began to collapse under its own fear. Colorado was the third to jump in 2023, returning home to the Big 12 conference, after which Utah, Arizona, and Arizona State followed them to start play in 2024. With the Pac-12 conference officially collapsing, Oregon and Washington announced their intentions that summer to join the Big Ten as the two largest brands remaining on the West Coast. Stanford and Cal ended up joining the ACC, and Oregon State and Washington State, left behind, will form scheduling agreements with the Mountain West, short of a full-on merger. The Big Ten, long a Midwestern staple of college football, will have four schools in California, Oregon, and Washington in 2024. It is a conference that now more than ever stretches from sea to shining sea, with schools on the East Coast joining these West Coast beacons. The Big Ten is set to have 18 total members. Following the lead of other larger conferences, the Big Ten also announced in 2023 that they would be eliminating divisions for the 2024 season and beyond, as the divisional structure of a larger conference could potentially hurt chances for putting multiple teams in an expanded college football playoff. Like the Big 12 did with only 10 members, the best two teams in the conference would make the championship regardless of geographical location. But with the conference's additions of the new teams and the now apparent arms race with the SEC, national championships became a pivotal focus, 
The Big Ten has many national championships throughout its storied history. In football, the conference boasts 43 claimed and outright titles. Michigan and Ohio State are your leaders for national titles won while members of the conference, but pay special heed to those three peating Gophers in the 30s. In basketball, the men's league is led by Indiana with national titles in 1940, 1953, 1976, 1981, and 1987. Despite claiming 10 total basketball national championships, the Big Ten has not won a men's title since 2000. Despite having the Fab Five, widely considered Michigan's best ever basketball team in 1991, the Wolverines only claim one national title in 1989. The women's league holds just one national title, Purdue, in 1999. The last of the revenue sports, baseball, faces a significantly lowered prestige, with only six national titles total, from 1953 to 1966. Minnesota leads the conference with three national titles. In softball, Michigan State won an AIAW national championship in 1976, but the only NCAA national championship belongs to Michigan in 2005. I'd be remiss not to talk about wrestling in a video about the Big Ten. Historically, the conference has been run by the Hawkeyes, but recently, Penn State has started to emerge as a title team. The men's track programs have nine total track and field championships, with Illinois claiming the majority. In the fall, for cross-country, the men claim 12 national championships, led by Wisconsin since 1982. Whiskey keeps the prominence on the women's side, winning two back-to-back, -back, but the other champion is Michigan State in 2014. In total, according to Wikipedia, the Big Ten claims just over 300 total national championships through this point in December 2023. Through the end of this year, that is the history of the Big Ten Conference. Some media outlets have started pushing an insider idea that Florida State will seek to leave the ACC for the Big Ten at some point in the near future, helping further push along realignment and consolidation between the two power conferences. Given my track record with these videos, there's a very real possibility that this now occurs for no reason other than the fact that I've made a video on it. It's a very scary trend. Burwinger, Nagurski, Tom Brady, Keedy, Harbaugh, Stagg, McCracken, and Lambert, Nick Saban's brief tenure at Michigan State, Tom Izzo, Hayden Fry, and Bill Snyder. There are literally too many to mention. They're a conference of leaders and legends. Uh, sorry. Regardless of the future of its parts, the Big Ten has now put itself in a position where it is one of two organizations that drive the college sports world forward alongside the SEC. Whatever happens to them will likely create shockwaves around the college sports world, especially considering their status as the largest conference in the country that stretches from the East to West Coast and further flirtation with Notre Dame and ACC schools continues. They hold the key to the future. All we can do is watch.